You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I am Paul Garner. And I am Todd Wood. Uh, As always, don't forget to subscribe, um, like, and share our episodes, share them with your friends, uh, and do leave a a comment or a question. Um, I guess at some point, Todd will come back and do another Q&A episode, so we, we like to get people's questions coming in. And uh, yeah, all all of that really helps us to sort of reach out to new listeners. So so please uh, do that and leave us a review as well on your favorite podcast streaming platform. Todd, um, today I'm looking forward to this episode because we've both been inspired by other creation scientists over the years. And one of the great Mm -hmm. things about doing this podcast is the opportunity it gives us to um, talk to many of them and to share some of their insights and some of their ideas with, with our audience. And I am particularly excited today because we're going to be talking to a creation geologist whose work has definitely been an inspiration to me and I, I know to lots of others. So I, I think this is going to be a really fascinating conversation. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think this is, it, for me, you, you know... Uh, when I'm a little starry-eyed during an interview because I start talking about when I was just a student, I got your book. Well, this is another one of those, when I was just a student, I got your book, and it really made a massive impact on me. So I'm really looking forward to our guest. And who is the guest? Well, uh, I'm going to read out from his bio because I've okay. got to read this. This is just fantastic, right? So according to his bio, um, our guest has carried out field work on six of the seven continents of the world. All right. Uh, his research has taken him by helicopter into the crater on Mount St. Helens, by bush plane onto glaciers in Alaska, uh, by raft through the Grand Canyon, on horseback into the High Sierra, by elevator into the world's deepest coal mines, by scuba onto the Great Barrier Reef, by rail into the Korean backcountry, by foot onto the barren plateaus of southern Argentina, and by four-wheel drive into the remote desert areas of Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Uh-huh. Now, I don't know about you, but that's, that sounds like someone who we could describe as the Indiana Jones of creationism. Pretty close to <laughs> and it. He- it sounds like we need to book him a, 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 a tour to uh, Antarctica, though. <laughs> yes, that's it, right. That's just right. Just to make yeah, it get- complete, right? <laughs> that's right. Tick the box, yeah. Uh, he is, of course, um, Dr. Steve Austin. Um, Steve, welcome to the show. We are delighted to have you. It's good to be here, Paul and uh, Todd. Just looking forward to doing uh, a little summary of kind of the career of a geologist. Yeah, that's what we thought we'd um, do today. Is it, This is kind of a li- the life of a creation geologist. And so there's a bit of sort of biography uh, in this. And... Um, yeah, we, we thought we'd just start by giving you the opportunity, Steve, just to sort of fill in. I mean, I've given you that, that amazing sort of bio there, but um, I'm sure there are all sorts of other details. So just, just fill in some of those for us, particularly your kind of educational, academic sort of career as well. Well, let me um, just say that I'm not going to talk a lot about science. I'm going to talk a lot about the interpretation of science. Okay, and uh, and maybe that uh, will kind of give you a, a taste of what it's like to be a geologist going to six continents. Maybe I'll get to Australia. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, you, so Steve, you can Steve, talk is it, to is me. It, my, I, is it, is it Australia that you haven't ahead. been to? Is it Australia you haven't been to? We thought it was Antarctica you haven't I've, been to. I've been all over Australia. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Of no, yeah. Antarctica. I haven't Antarctica. been to Antarctica. <laughs> that right? Okay. Right. That's and where I we need to buy the plane ticket. Yeah, I haven't been to Antarctica, and uh, I, there's a lot of good things I want to check off. Mount Erebus is a volcano, and and uh, Antarctica, and I definitely want to go see that because uh, yeah. it's like yeah. Mount St. Helens. But okay, so I I'd like to talk to you about my career as a geologist. And maybe some high points on the uh, where the science impacted me most. Maybe that's the way to say it. And uh, maybe the first thing to talk about is my childhood. And mm. uh, 
and you could do a whole broadcast or a podcast on that subject. But uh, uh, I'm uh, my mom was a chemist, but she was a housewife. She had a degree in chemistry, worked for DuPont, and my dad was a, a maintenance inspector at United Airlines. Uh, <laughs> Um, and he oversaw the fixing of the of the engines and the, the controls of the of uh, air uh, prop aircraft the United Airlines. And uh, but he was a prospector. His hobby was prospecting, and so I got out and looked at a lot of uh, placer gold. And he, yeah. Uh, uh, was interested also in radioactive minerals. So I learned about carnitite and other things like that. By the time I was four years old, I saw my first geologic map and started collecting rocks. And um, when I was eight years old, I was possessing an enormous rock collection. Every, every square inch under my bed was... Uh, uh, occupied by rocks, okay, and I, I see Paul smiling because he <laughs> he's also a yeah. geologist and gets afflicted with these things. And then <laughs> um, uh, my rock collection went to school, and the the teachers asked about my rock collection. When I was eight years old, um, a, a TV program in San Francisco on KQED television uh, put on mystery objects. I started identifying mystery objects that were uh, on TV. And uh, eventually my mom got a letter from the TV studio. Is this guy for real? And uh, they wanted me to be on television. And so I was on television for three years. And I met a whole bunch of uh, scientists. It was really cool and uh so, so i'm in the green room at, at a television studio meeting the scientists you get to this you get to ask them a whole bunch of questions or get their advice and uh it it was uh it was good time to meet these people and um uh, and then uh um uh, i became the boy that wanted to build brontosaurus okay and and uh I, I see Paul smiling because I don't think I've told him this part of the story. But mm. uh, I remember in 1953, the uh, Life magazine came out with Brontosaurus on the front cover. And from then on, I was hooked. I was uh, uh, interested in dinos and rocks and minerals and all that kind of thing. So. Uh, and then uh, when I got interested in dinosaurs, um, I, uh, I got a very big disappointment, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, this happened over a 10-year period, but I realized that everything on the front cover of Life magazine with the brontosaurus was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about the only thing that was right was the... Uh, they had part of a fossil, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I learned that they had the wrong head on the brontosaurus, and uh, in the quarry site at Dinosaur National Monument, uh, Earl, um, um, the um, the the, uh, the the dinosaur paleontologist inserted the wrong skull on the articulated. Uh, animal and called it brontosaurus and uh, yeah so uh, Douglas the, uh, the the paleontologist had built a chimera dinosaur that really didn't exist and it was a body of a apatosaurus and the skull of a, a diplodocus that was assembled to make brontosaurus and uh, that disappointed me really bad because we we had the we, we had the wrong terminology on the dinosaur and uh at, for a kid like me uh interested in the details i wanted to build a brontosaurus in my backyard and the parts list was defective and uh, i couldn't build them 
And uh, then, uh, you know, Brontosaurus lived in this kind of lush park, you know, along the, the channel of a meandering river, okay? And um, the, the more I thought about the dinosaur outcrop and the quarry wall at Dinosaur National Monument, the more objections I had to it. Now, the most important fossil, abundant fossil on the, on the outcrop is not dinosaur, it's unio, a clam clam fossil. And so I started thinking about the, the meandering river with clam fossils. No, can't. Uh, that's, a, that, that's an ocean organism. So how, how do you uh, build the, the whole habitat of the dinosaur? Well, of course, he lived on uh, uh, the dinosaur environment uh, with the, the bank of the river and of course, he chewed ferns. And in the background are all these carnivorous dinosaurs and all that kind of thing that went on. Mm -hmm. I realized that <laughs> it's a bogus picture. And then I started reflecting on it. After, when I was about 15, I was sure that geology was agenda driven science. And uh, people have these images that drive their interpretation of uh, the data. And uh, gender-driven science was all around me. And I realized it's uniformitarian doctrine. And then it, uh, when I took geology program in high school, believe it or not, there was a, a semester class on geology. I, uh, uh, I, I encountered uniformitarianism. And uh, in the textbook, it was a scientific law like any other uh, um, any other law of science, it's considered valid because all known facts conform to it. Okay. And I said, this is baloney. In my textbook in high school, I could see this false agenda. Okay. And it wasn't evolution per se that generated it. It was uniformitarian thinking. So I was ready to, uh, ready to expunge that way of thinking from doing science. And uh, when I uh, went to University of Washington in Seattle, Washington, that's when um, uh, my advisor said, Steve, if you continue to think this way about agenda-driven science, you'll be of no value as a geologist. Okay. And uh, so uh, go lightly on this way of thinking. and. Uh, you can uh, uh, you can benefit from the education it will give you at this university. <laughs> so I spent more time at the university reading journals than I did reading textbooks for my courses, and I uh, basically ditched uniformitarian geology. And uh, I read uh, when I was twelve years old. I read uh, George Gaylord Simpson's book, The Meaning of Evolution. And I realized that evolution was derived from this uniformitarian agenda that pervades geology. And uh, I want to think creatively about uh, alternates to evolution, but I need to think right about geology. And mm -hmm. so when I went to school at uh, undergraduate school, I just started reading journals profusely. And what I did is I had written my, my master's thesis when I was an undergraduate student. And I had my, my thesis in my back pocket ready to go to, to uh, graduate school. And uh, what I did is I just basically said uh, to uh, the geology uh, program at San Jose State University, uh, would you accept a thesis on this subject, critique of uniformitarianism? In other words, uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm gonna give you critical reasons why you don't want to think about uniformitarianism as an agenda to drive uh, geology. And, and the the uh, department chairman said, "Yes, we'll accept a thesis like that." And uh, so I submitted. 11 months later, I completed all the courses, and then I submitted the, uh, uh, the thesis and critique of uniformitarianism. 
And uh, I don't want to go into all the details of what happened, but just realize that it happened. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the the details that allowed me to critique the whole uh, paradigm of geology in a thesis. And um, I had permission. <laughs> so mm. that, what happened is uh, um, I went to graduate school. And uh, in graduate school, I started working on my uh, dissert dissertation before I even went to graduate school. And so I asked the professors at Penn State University, would you accept a thesis on coal geology uh, of, a, of a coal bed in Kentucky? And they realized I'd written a thesis on critique of uniformitarianism, and uh, it became an interesting subject to the graduate school. And then, then I went uh, and did, did a PhD on the origin of coal. Uh, when I did the PhD dissertation, I framed the problem uh, during the uh, energy crisis in the, in the Mid seventies, I mm -hmm. I stated it as a uh, what would you say? Uh, I stated it as a uh, uh, a proposition, and uh, and the proposition, the conventional theory for the origin of coal, and I want to contrast that with some other model. But anyway, uh, the the PhD dissertation was on um, the Kentucky number 12 coal bed in Western Kentucky. And uh, over a four year period, I minutely studied the structure of the coal bed, the composition, texture, structure, form, and association of the coal bed, six different things about the coal bed. And when I came away, uh, my professor said, in six different uh, chapters, you've disproven the swamp origin for the coal bed in Kentucky. And uh, you've done it to our satisfaction. And then, you know what he said? He said, you can't turn in a dissertation disproving a theory. You can't <laughs> do that. And uh, you got to come up with your own theory for the origin of the coal bed in western Kentucky not disprove a theory okay and so he he asked for it in my back pocket i had chapter seven of my uh, phd <laughs> dissertation which was on the floating mat model for the origin of coal yeah i can i can see paul there uh, smiling because he knows the rest of the story now yeah. well uh <laughs> 10 months after i turned in my phd dissertation mount saint helens exploded and made a floating log mat for me to study and uh yeah it was uh, a cool thing anyway yeah, my, so, yeah go ahead well Paul. i was just i was just going to say that that kind of brings us then to your interest in mount st helens uh right. and this has been such a you know many people will know you for your research on mount st helens that's perhaps how they first encountered you you know speaking about that and it's been a lifelong yeah. study hasn't it so so yeah tell, tell us about mount st helens so uh, a graduate of University of Washington who had a favorite volcano in the Cascade Range, it's called Mount St. Helens, uh, he had uh, written his dissertation in 1979 on the floating map model for the origin of coal. And then I discovered something at Mount St. Helens. There was a gigantic floating mat of dead logs uh, several square miles in area on the lake north of Mount St. Helens. And so it became a living laboratory for, for studying the origin of coal. Um, I asked uh, D. James Kennedy, a, uh, a Calvinist theologian, you, you may, uh, you know about Calvinism, and, and, and I, I'm not exactly a wholehearted five-point Calvinist, but uh, uh, I wanted to know what he thought. <laughs> and, you know, what are the odds that I uh, would 
study geology at University of Washington next to Mount St. Helens. And uh, what are the odds that I write a, th a thesis on the origin of coal disproving uh, the conventional explanation and writing about a really harebrained idea of, uh, of a coal bed forming underneath a floating log mat. And then 10 months later, it happened, a, a living uh, modern example of a floating log mat. Uh, D. James Kennedy said, yes, God causes the affairs of man and nature to cross. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that began my career as a professional creation geologist. And I think I'm the first to be employed by a creation organization full-time as a geologist. That yeah. was 1979, uh, right, as, right before Mount St. Helens exploded. I'm, I'm, I'm established uh, as a researcher at Institute for Creation Research. Mm. Mount St. Helens was a good experience. There, there weren't yeah. many. Um, there weren't many creationists with a PhD in geology at that time. Um, I, I don't know how many there were, but there weren't many, were there? Um, one. <laughs> Me. Was there just, just, uh, just you? Was, was there anybody before you? Um, there was. Uh, well, Leonard Brand was a, a you know, and. Uh, Couple other people from the zoology side came in, uh, yeah, and, and uh, were in the field very early. Uh, Leonard Brand um, and uh, um, Clifford Burdick had a PhD from yeah. the University of Arizona, but after he became a creationist, they uh, re re refused his degree. They they got it bound up in politics, right. and he never was conferred a PhD technically uh, until right. until uh, months later, years later. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it was kind of early. So what yeah. happened at Mount St. Helens uh, was Disneyland for me, right? That that was <laughs> Disneyland. Okay, and uh, everything was formed rapidly, and boy, was there a lot formed rapidly, like. A peat layer was buried on the bottom of the lake. Obviously, that that's the only thing that I believed was possible. The other things I, I would have argued against, you know, rapidly formed strata, you know, laminated strata. We we think of that as forming slowly, uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, no, it wouldn't form in a hurricane uh, at a hundred mile per hour. That that thing can't happen. And uh, yeah. Uh, Erosion, that can't happen. Uh, erosion of canyons, even solid rock, hundreds of feet deep, oh, that can't happen. And uh, sure enough, it did. <laughs> it happened in Mount St. Helens. <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, um, and then origin of coal. So, so yeah. everything was uh, kind of cool right there. And uh, um, yeah, the... Uh, the um, D. James Kennedy said, yes, God causes the affairs of man and nature to cross. <laughs> and, uh, well, <laughs> so, so now I'm, uh, what, what else should I do? And that's when I'm in Southern California and San Diego area, of course, one of my favorite places on earth is Grand Canyon. And so I started mm -hmm. leading field trips to Grand Canyon. Uh, we got school buses. Uh, and we'd get a school bus and get 50 people in the school bus and, and drive out to Grand Canyon. And then we started getting uh, uh, contract busing like uh, Greyhound bus and trailways and that kind of thing. And we started leading uh, rim tours and then hikes in Grand Canyon, raft trips through Grand Canyon, helicopter overflights of Grand Canyon, that kind of thing. And uh, Grand Canyon became my favorite place to live basically uh mount st helens uh next to an active volcano well and and lots of geologic activity like landslides and whatnot uh, uh no uh, uh, uh grand canyon is more to my liking so then i uh, we started studying the fossil layer of grand canyon and started uh studying the erosion of grand canyon yeah. Uh, how well do we know the fossil layers of Grand Canyon? The uniform agenda 
uniformitarian agenda has driven science. And so there's a lot of things I believe we can learn at Grand Canyon. And so I specialized in one limestone layer in, in Grand Canyon, a Redwall limestone fossil deposit. And then the other thing that bothered me about Grand Canyon it was the uniformitarian agenda about how Grand Canyon formed very slowly by the Colorado River over tens of millions of years since the age of dinosaurs, basically. And uh, it, I, I discovered that we don't have a, unif a unified theory on the, the erosion of Grand Canyon, and we know next to nothing about the fossil deposits, the real interpretations. So, mm. so that's when I was studying those things. Yeah. Now, I, I remember back in 2004, I had the great um, privilege of being on a Grand Canyon raft trip uh, that you led along with Andrew Snelling. Yes. And I remember seeing the fossil nautiloids in the nautiloid bed. So, uh, I mean, tell us a bit about how you kind of discovered that uh, nautiloid layer and how you traced it along the, the length of the canyon. Tell us about okay, that. Well I, didn't okay, well, I didn't discover the nautiloid layer. A boatman uh, oh. on a Grand Canyon River trip told me about uh, about the the uh, I was just saying, hey, where's your favorite fossil deposits? And there's this, this one out in uh, in Nautiloid Canyon. Okay, it has a name already. It's where nautiloids occur, and so that's that's what got me there. Uh, I um, I I don't want to talk about a 35 year investigation <laughs> in 10 minutes, even five <laughs> minutes. So. Okay. But there were 80 nautiloids on the ledge, and I discovered uh, eventually after uh, a couple of years that it was very extensive. It went down three miles along the river in Grand Canyon. And uh, then I asked, well, how widespread is the, the fossil layer with these large squid-like organisms in a, in, a, in a shell? They're squid in a shell, and, uh, and they taper one to seven ratio. and uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, I was seeing hundreds at, at the end of uh, uh, 1998. I had seen hundreds. By 1999, I was asking, uh, could this be an extensive layer in Grand Canyon? And so I started pursuing it as, as an extensive layer. And then I started finding nautiloids along the whole Grand Canyon. Through 100 miles of Grand Canyon, I was finding nautiloids. And uh, I talked to the nautiloid expert in uh, Alan Titus, the North American nautiloid expert, PhD in paleontology of nautiloids. And I'm talking to him about the, the widespread nautiloids in Grand Canyon. And he said, how many have you seen? And I, I told him I've drawn pictures of a 1,000 nautiloids. How many have you seen? <laughs> Large nautiloids. He says, you've seen more nautiloids, than, large nautiloids than I have. And, uh, and, and you, you've seen them all in one layer. And uh, so all that happened. I started discovering nautiloids to the west of Grand Canyon in Lake Mead area. Then I started finding nautiloids uh, over in uh, Las Vegas at, on Frenchman Mountain. And so the whole length of the nautiloid deposit, the two meter thick layer, seven feet in thickness, nautiloids in the center of the nautiloid bed is about 160 miles long. Yeah. So we, we found nautiloids, and I've seen, thou, I've drawn pictures of thousands. How many I've seen? I don't know. But, uh, and, uh, but uh, it's a very extensive deposit. And I had a thesis student work for me, uh, Derry Stansbury, and Derry was studying the uh, how the fossil deposit ends. That was his master's thesis. How how does the nautiloid deposit end? It's a two meter thick layer that goes 160 miles through Grand Canyon out to uh, Lake Mead area and in Nevada into uh, Las Vegas, right uh, on the uh, mountain, just directly east, high le eye level with the Stratosphere Hotel. 
is our nautiloids out there in the, uh, in Nevada. And uh, so he's, I give him the project of how does a nautiloid bed end? And guess what? He did his thesis on how it ends, but he couldn't find the end. It goes for another uh, uh, 100 miles to the west, and he still never found the end of it. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, uh, it's, it becomes bigger every year, and, and so we, we, we need to continue to study it. Anyway, I proposed a mechanism where it, f it formed by an underwater debris flow, essentially a, uh, a hydroplaning, high-density flow that moved at about six meters per second over the bottom of the ocean. And it flowed over essentially a level surface, and I performed the modeling of it uh, using 1D equations. Um, the 1D equations are uh, balancing pressure, essentially. I did a pressure balance, and it indicated to me that the debris flow would be stable at about meters per second velocity. And then um, some modelers made it in a uh, deep tank called the fish tank at St. Anthony Falls Lab in uh, uh, in in uh minneapolis minnesota so uh and then i had a, a computer modeler a computational fluid dynamicist model that com uh, using 2d equ uh, equations uh, and 2d simulation is a much better than a one degree simulation so i uh, i gave him the project hey can you solve this uh uh this model uh make a model using 2D of a fast moving debris flow. And he did it. He did it with 2D. Uh, and I remember, I remember giving him the problem. You can do it on 2D. Uh, I can do it 1D, six meters per second. He modeled it 2D. And uh, when I called him back after giving him the problem, uh, I said, how did it go with that uh, computer modeling of that uh, high velocity uh, flow. And he said, I remember the phone call, wow, they fly. <laughs> he spent all of his time <laughs> emphasizing fly. Okay. After, uh, after he modeled it, he said, and he, he, he made a two dimensional cross section of the flow. Uh, using computational fluid dynamics. And it was a streamlined wing shape. Over the top of it, it had low pressure. Underneath it, it had high pressure. And he said, wow, they fly. And he, he, it was aerodynamically or hydrodynamically a wing that moved <laughs> at about, like I guessed, about six meters per second. And it had... Uh, a hydroplane under the leading edge of the wing shape, and uh, it could form the the nautiloid deposit. <laughs> that that's fantastic. And do you do you think, Steve, that that's typical of how other beds within the red wall limestone were deposited, even the ones that say don't have a nautiloid population yeah. buried in them? Yeah, uh, not abundant nautiloids, but I think other the other course. Uh, Sandy limestone deposit were deposited by debris flow. And uh, there's a lot of implications to go on this. Uh, what I'm interested in doing is attracting other creation scientists to thinking of nautiloid deposits as underwater debris flows forming at very high velocity. And for example, uh, there's one in St. Louis, Missouri, in the yeah. Ordovician. Uh, uh, there's an Ordovician nautiloid deposit. The, or the nautiloids have orientation. Um, they uh, and this that that's one of the scientific observations about the nautiloid deposit in Grand Canyon. And they're buried rapidly because there's vertically standing nautiloids tip end down in the, the nautiloid bed. Yeah. And so uh, yeah, um, 
Zach Klein, for example, he's a mm-hmm. he's a geology student and he's very interested in nautiloids. And so other nautiloids, they're in Arkansas, they're in Illinois, they're in uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, obviously, and so they, they look like debris flows as well. So yeah, mass I, kill I got to- uh, mass kill deposits. I got to see um, the nautiloids with Zach last summer. He, t- he took me out in the field and we discovered some more nautiloids. We went yeah. looking for some more in some other road cuts and we found, we found more. So, it, yeah, that was fun. It's a highly addictive subject, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you probably sense that, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and these are, those are big nautiloids that he was discovered, yeah. right? How big yeah. were the ones you saw? Uh, maybe a foot long. Yeah. Most of what I was seeing about the length of your arm, uh, Mm -hmm. two feet long on the average. But yeah, so these nautiloids are abundant. And so we need to think outside the box. And uh, this is not slow death on a a calm and placid ocean floor. (laughs) No, it's not the cumulative uh, deposition of, of... an inch every thousand years in a in a calm and placid epicontinental sea. That's <laughs> that's junk science. The way I, I would think of it. Yeah. And so we need to think outside the box. And one of one of the, the other things, Steve, just to kind of uh, shift gear a bit, um, with regards to Grand Canyon, that I know you've been very interested in is and you mentioned it earlier, how Grand Canyon was carved. Yes. Um, so t- tell us a bit about that as well. That's a fascinating well, story. Yeah. Okay. Over the years of studying Grand Canyon, I realized that geologists had no comprehensive story to tell about Grand Canyon erosion. You'd think it would be an easy problem to solve, wouldn't you? You know, <laughs> like the Colorado River carved it over tens of millions of years. That's the conventional that we learned. I learned in high school, but I, when I went to graduate school, I learned that that's junk science, and uh, not a lot of geologists want to talk about the evidence of that subject and uh, of slow and gradual erosion of Grand Canyon over tens of millions of years. Uh, it appears that Grand Canyon formed uh, abruptly during the Pliocene, which would be just uh, recently in geologic history, and all of a sudden the canyon is there, and there's an ice age upstream. And uh, whatever I started thinking very early, about 35 years ago, about Grand Canyon formed from overtopping of lakes. Now there's a, a giant... Um, geologic structure, fold structure called the monocline, East East Kaibab monocline, directly east of Grand Canyon. And that makes the Upwarp Kaibab Plateau, which is a barrier, and there could be a lake behind that barrier. And so over the years, I've been studying that lake and the evidence of the lake. And uh, I've been uh, interested in finding the deposits and the erosional terraces near the shoreline of that lake. And uh, yeah, there is really good evidence of a shoreline uh, of a big lake. And how big is a lake? It's about the size of Lake Michigan, okay? Directly east of Grand Canyon, like a smoking gun at the scene of a crime, okay? (laughs) To me. So why not think that way about catastrophic drainage of a lake over the plateau? And uh, so that's what uh, I kind of became uh, very interested in. And uh, I've generated this theory over 35 years, and about 20 geologists that I know are familiar with also think highly of the explanation. And they're thinking the same way. These people have PhDs, and they're thinking about spillover models for a lake forming Grand Canyon. And in other words, there's a catastrophic explanation for the erosion of Grand Canyon, and it happens in a fraction of a million years. And it, it's uniformitarianism leads to junk science when thinking about erosion of Grand Canyon. 
And there got to be more outside the box, uh, catastrophic ways of thinking. And yeah. so, yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And current in the last uh, 10 years, I've done quite a bit of field work off to the east of Grand Canyon, working with that the lake model for the erosion of Grand Canyon. So uh, a lot, uh, is it a little time and a lot of water, a catastrophic ex explanation, or is it a lot of time and just a little trickle of water, the Colorado River eroding Grand Canyon? So yeah, it, it's, it's nice to think outside the box because it's starting to generate good ways of thinking. Yeah, that's great. Well, we've we've touched on you know a number of aspects of of your sort of career in in creation geology, but one that we haven't talked about yet, and we we ought to uh, mention, is your interest in earthquakes, and in particular the earthquakes which are recorded in the Bible. Yeah. Um. So t tell us about that. I mean, why why do earthquakes occur so frequently in the Holy Land, Steve? I mean, that maybe we could begin there. Yeah, it's. The, it, it's a fault called the Dead Sea Jordan Fault, and it's along the Dead Sea, and uh, that's why earthquakes are very abundant in the Holy Land. And uh, I've known that that earthquake fault, its two plate boundaries, has been involved with uh, 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 the, the history. We have 4,000 years of history, right? from the Bible to the present uh, in the Holy Land. So it's like the San Andreas Fault in California, which only has 250 years of recorded history. The, the, uh, the, San, the uh, Dead Sea Jordan Rift Fault, the boundary between the plates in the Middle East, that is 4,000 year history. Uh, don't, it's a complicated story about uh, paradigm systems, but l let me introduce it by uh, just my way of thinking. It, uh, as I read the Bible, there are a lot of earthquakes in the Bible, right? If you start thinking about it, there's at least 10 big ones in the Bible. The earthquake at the cross when Jesus dies, the earthquake at the resurrection when at the tomb. There's earthquakes uh, during the time of Herod the Great which forms the, the context of uh, the New Testament, which it, there will be earthquakes in diverse places. Jesus is referring to all the earthquakes that have been occurring over history in, uh, uh, in, in the Holy Land. Um, in, and, and, of course, the flood and creation are uh, told in earthquake kind of imagery. And uh, so, uh, but... Uh, I discovered something. I need to talk to Bible and psychology majors at uh, at a liberal arts college, and I need to talk to them in a certain way. I can't talk to them about science uh, directly. If you're a if you're a uh, if if you're a Bible major or a psychology major, you got to hear a, a different way of beginning the story. You can't begin with science. So uh, what I did was at uh, Christian Heritage College, when I was originally teaching there, the, uh, the science program, in the science program, I started developing lunch lectures. And uh, the lunch lecture was for anybody interested in hearing something that's interesting to everybody, but from a scientist. And so I talked about events in prophecy. And uh, I, I had a, a lecture that uh, I was told to develop. And uh, what I developed was a, a lecture on uh, you need to know about earthquakes because they're mentioned in prophecy. And I took the 14th chapter of Jeremiah and developed the thought you should, uh, you know, you shall flee as you fled before the earthquake in days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and then Jesus will come back during the exodus of the city by the survivors of a giant earthquake. They'll be rescued from uh, the earthquake, 
by the Mount of Olives splitting in two, and they'll flee eastward to Azel from the uh, through the the giant earthquake fault that's produced. And you need to know about this because uh, you're going to come back with Jesus, and Jesus is going to be there. So you'll be there to see the giant earthquake. And that was the the venue for the science. And when I gave that lecture, I I, I mused about it uh, to the students, and I said, "Hey, that must have been a big earthquake back there in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah." because you're going to flee before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, Judah. You're going to flee like that when Messiah comes back and the Mount of Olives splits and uh, Jesus comes back to reign on earth. And, uh, so sh- and so I argued to the psych and to the uh, the Bible majors, uh, you need to consider this big earthquake in the days of Uzziah, 750 B.C. So that's a huge earthquake. And I, I argued it from the standpoint of um, of history, and so I said, "Hey, you people here in San Diego, how many of you heard about the earthquake in 1906, the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco?" And nobody raised their hand. Then I said, "How many?" After uh, the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, 750 B.C., that's the time of Isaiah, 230 years later, after the exile, the returned captives from uh, Babylon are returned to Jerusalem, and Zechariah says, hey, you guys, you remember the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah? That's what the what the what it's going to be like when uh, Jesus returns. In other words, he recalled the earthquake 230 years before. And nobody could remember the earthquake 70 years before in San Francisco. Not even a grandfather could tell them or anything about the earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. How, how about the earthquake uh, 230 years later? Well, the, what, here's what happened. I, I said to the student, I said to, the, to one of the students, uh, can you remember the earthquake? And no. And, I, and I, I, uh, this, this kid came up. He was a graduate. He was a senior in biology. Uh, I, a, uh, um, he was a, a major in Bible. And he says, I'm going to the Institute for Holy Land Studies in Jerusalem. And... Uh, I'll take a look for the earthquake. And I'm specializing on Iron 2B architecture, and um, uh, I'll let you know how I'll do it. So I, I said somebody ought to, ought to go look for the earthquake evidence, and he took up the, 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 uh, the task. And for a period of 17 years, he reported back to me uh, all the earthquake evidence he was finding in Iron 2B architecture. And at the end of 17 years, uh, this is in about 1990, I'm saying to him, I got to go see what you're, what you're finding. And so I started uh, doing the architect, uh, doing looking at architecture in the architect, all, all the archaeo- archaeological sites that he had discovered, earthquake evidence. And um I discovered I had the skill set to analyze the sediment in the bottom of the lake. And so I started looking for the evidence of Uzziah's earthquake. Amos's earthquake is what I call it, because the book of Amos is dated by the earthquake. So I found found a big, uh, huge, disturbed sediment layer back there at 750 BC, just like uh, Amos said, and it's a huge earthquake. And it's the largest earthquake in 4,000 years in uh, Dead Sea, Upper Dead Sea sediment record. So anyway, the, uh, the short story is I started looking for all the other earthquake evidence of the Bible, the other biblical earthquakes, and started finding them. And right where they should be, in about nine meters thickness, 
uh, of sediment the last 4,000 years in uh, the Dead Sea, there's, there's an earthquake record strongly confirming the Bible <laughs> and the climate change of the Bible. So, I, uh, you know, climate change and uh, uh, global warming is the model, right? Uh, everybody's talking about, I can talk about global warming in uh, Dead Sea sediment. And, uh, and there have been a lot of periods where it's been warmer in, in biblical history than, than at present. I'm really alarmed by, uh, uh, too much by uh, global warming today because it's been a lot warmer back in uh, Middle East history and uh, um, medieval history and back during the time of Christ. The lake level was higher and was even warmer then. So uh, anyway, that led to a whole bunch of interesting subjects. So what yeah. what did you say about a uh, a a a career as a creation a creation geologist? Uh, it's been kind of an over the top experience, and that's what's led me around to geology on other continents and looking at Bible history from the standpoint of, of, uh, of geology. Yeah. Sedimentary yeah. record. I believe there's a, a one centimeter thick layer in the bottom of Dead Sea that was formed about plus or minus three or four years of the, uh, of the time about 33 AD, plus or minus three or four years. What could that be? Could that be the earthquake at the cross? I think it's there in the sediment. Uh, Amos's earthquake is there. The earthquake, uh, bigger, the bi other big earthquake is the time of Josephus and Herod's earthquake, uh, 31 BC. The 31 BC earthquake is a big earthquake that sets the context for earthquakes in the rest of uh, the New Testament. And um, there's earthquake records uh, going back, probably Sodom Gomorrah time. I think I'm seeing earthquake evidence there. And uh, of course, the Bible uh, flood, the, the Genesis flood is a gigantic earthquake. And so you're seeing sedimentary evidence of gigantic earthquakes in the past and creation evidence. Uh, you know, the biggest tectonic event in the history of planet Earth is probably day three of creation week. God caused the waters to be collected together in the oceans, and he called them seas. And the, the dry land, he called it, uh, you know, continent. And uh, so, uh, yeah, there's big earthquake evidence in the Bible, totally consistent with the biblical framework. Yeah. So is it a good time to be a geologist studying uh, Earth history and the Bible? Yeah. Cool thing happened. So yeah. uh, my career as a geologist is uh, kind of, well, it, it is like Indiana Jones in a way. And uh, it's to see thinking outside the box uh, kind of thinking. Now, let me let me talk about geology. Just one last thing, you know, people uh, are starting to think catastrophic thoughts, right? And they're starting to notice things. There, there's catastrophic evidence all around in geology, and people like me are thinking outside the box, and they're starting to appreciate my way of thinking outside the box like a gigantic fossil deposit in Grand Canyon, like a lake draining to make Grand Canyon, like, hey, Mount St. Helens, a miniature scale model of Noah's flood, basically, that kind of thing. So um, it's a cool thing to happen. Yeah. So does God cause the affairs of man and nature to cross? I, I, I remember uh, talking to the Calvinist theologian, and he, he says, yes, uh, now pinch me, you know, I can't believe it happened. <laughs> so, Steve, what would be your advice to a young person who is interested in studying geology as a creationist? I mean, what, what advice could you give them? 
well, uh, you got to study conventional geology. No, no way around it. You have to study it. And uh, I would say go to a university for a minimum of five years and absorb the uniformitarian and evolutionary science that they offer. But you got to be um, you got to be militant at uh, um, basically rethinking the the thinking pattern that they're going to offer you at the university and think outside the box. And you got to think about creation and the flood. And uh, that's, the, that's the great thing about uh, what we're on about is God has in the Bible, basically the framework of uh, uh, for thinking in the Bible. And and so you got to be ready to contend with the dinosaur disappointment. And uh, yeah, it was uh, as a kid, it was a very disappointing experience. You know, uh, they had the wrong head on Brontosaurus and never existed. And the park in which the Jurassic Park in which he um, was munching on the ferns at the at the bank of the river that's a fiction too you know uh he was buried in some kind of uh of uh, marine disaster okay and you you got to start thinking that way uh you, you can't think uh that, that the, the normal way of thinking mm -hmm. that that's my advice so uh go to school but you got to critique the system and uh, you got to you, you you gotta know that there is a a, a, a quasi science or a science sounding agenda that's driving geology, and you gotta go beyond that and uh, get to the uh, good interpretation of geologic data. So you gotta go to f go at least five years at a major university uh, to encounter the subjects you need to explore this do new domain. And then from there, uh, you probably do graduate work at the university on disproving a theory, for example. Uh, that, 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 that's what I'd recommend. I disproved the origin of a coal bed from a swamp, uh, but you could do some, uh, you know, another, uh, the next generation needs to be encouraged to generate uh, outside the box thinking about, well, the origin of limestone, uh, mass kill fossil deposits, origin of canyons. Um, yeah, so study catastrophic process like Mount St. Helens. It just happened to come along at the right time. Uh, <laughs> and, then, uh, and, and then do your graduate school. And graduate school can be detailed, but you want to select a subject and select a useful subject, one that directly impacts the the agenda-driven science that we have today. That's very good advice. Um, that's, been, that's been brilliant. I'm shaking his head a little bit too. Yeah. So, yeah. No, now, I've, I've been Todd is is kind of a paleontologist, right? Well, and. And I'm an offense to somebody like him because <laughs> I see fossils as interesting sedimentary objects. Yes, as rocks. Not yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I'm sort I of, a, I'm clearing away the sediment so I can see the, the fossil. Yeah. It's a different right, thing. He throws away yeah. the sediment. <laughs> like the most interesting thing is what's enclosing the fossil. They're sedimentary <laughs> objects within the <laughs> within the geologic <laughs> deposit yeah <laughs> uh Oh, that's been brilliant. Uh, there, is, there are so many things that we haven't talked about. We haven't talked about racetrack flumes with mudstone deposition. or I know, I know as well a paper that you published on the Capitan Reef Complex in, you know, out there in Texas, and that would be interesting to talk about. So many things you know, that we, we could have touched on, uh, things that you've published over the years, Steve. But that, that, was, that was brilliant as a, an overview of a life in creation geology. And I hope it's, it's an inspiration to many of our listeners, some of whom may be interested in going on a study in geology and maybe they'll be that next generation. Uh, 
Thank you now, so if, much if for joining wanna, us. If you want to hear the boring science behind <laughs> uh, the limestone layer in Grand Canyon or the the terrace evidence uh, in uh, northeastern Arizona for the big lake the size of Mi Lake Michigan, something like that, you uh, you can find that. It's around, okay, but yeah. – uh, yeah, we we need to tell the story in overview. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a great story. Um, yeah, what a, what a fantastic career. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. The other, I I don't like being ta talking geology except in front of rocks, right? <laughs> Even PowerPoint is uh, an inferior yeah. mode to experience rocks. You have to go out and find the fossils yourself. And you got to ask the right questions. So asking the right questions and developing the right observation skills. So you got to go out and leave the uh, laboratory behind. You need, to, you need to get out in the field ask the right questions, and then and, uh, generate the correct observations about the, the – and develop the science. Yeah. Well, Todd, there's a challenge for us. We're, we're going to have yeah. to do that. We're going to have to go out in the field with, with Steve and record something out in front of the rock. So. I guess. I mean, if we have to, we have to. What are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, now, here's have – you, have you got a minute? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not make it a, uh, th this sounds wild. Uh, I know a friend of mine who can land uh, a 12-seat Otter aircraft on a glacier in Alaska at 17,000 feet. Okay. We could start the lecture at 17,000 feet on a glacier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can patch into the satellite and then we can record the next segment of the lecture, say, on uh, the um, on McCall Ridge at uh, 7,000 feet elevation. I know he can land there, okay, and uh, he, he can bring tw it's a 12 seater aircraft so we could bring us all along. And then he could fly the Copper River, which is a, da a Chitna River upstream, Chopper River downstream, and he could land on the he could land on the the sh shore of the Gulf of Alaska at sea level. He could he can do the flight in forty five minutes, okay, and we could be patched up in between uh, the 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 lecture sites with uh, sound in on the seat of the aircraft going by landmarks and then landing at these key places. And then uh, wouldn't that be cool? And, uh, <laughs> that would be very cool. <laughs> uh, and, and then at the end of the podcast, hey, are there any questions for you guys? And then open it to questions. We're on the Gulf of Alaska with the, uh, the 12-seater Otter aircraft sitting there. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that would be something <laughs> if anyone and would then, like to, make uh, it how many people are going to want to talk about evolution during that? Now, nah, nobody's going to want to talk about evolution. They're going to talk about what, what is there, right? Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> if anybody wants to sponsor that trip, do, do make a contribution at yes. let's talk creation.org. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah yeah let's make that happen uh we we're going to call it a day there um thank you so much steve for, for joining us we do hope you'll come back on as a guest and we'll, we'll do some other things uh, together on the podcast that that's been absolutely brilliant uh listeners viewers i don't know what's coming next um magical mystery tour as usual so uh, join us in a couple of weeks time and uh, we'll see you then see ya Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes and all our show notes. 
If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.